but we have a very packed agenda, so I wanted to kick things off. My name is Lori Lucas, and I'm the president and CEO of the Employee Benefit Research Institute. Um, welcome to the American Savings Education Council Partners Meeting, our uh, virtual meeting uh, uh, this year. Uh, normally, we have these meetings in Washington, um, and normally they're spring meetings, but um, we've switched things around and uh, very delighted to have a star-studded group of uh, panelists from all over the country uh, speaking today. So if we turn to the next slide, we can see the agenda. We are uh, focusing very much on the times uh, during this uh, uh, ASIC meeting. We'll start off with a panel on the state of savings or lack thereof during COVID-19 um, and following up with emergency savings in 401k's role. We'll have a brief break and then we'll turn to a very important, increasingly important topic, uh, caregiving and COVID-19. And then um, as per usual, we will have our ASIC partner update. Uh, normally in Washington when we do this, this is kind of a, a little networking session where the partners talk about what's going on in their organizations and we get to understand how all of um, the, uh, the people in the room are helping people to do better in terms of saving. So there are a lot of new people uh, here today that have perhaps have not been to an ASIC meeting before. If we turn to the next slide, we'll give you um, a sense of how you can um, ask questions, and then I'll, I'll uh, give you a little bit more sense of ASIC mission. So as um, usual with these um, uh, webinars, we will have uh, a chat box that you can ask questions throughout the session. Uh, we will leave time at the end of each session to answer the questions. But um, on the next slide, we have another way of asking questions, which is raising your hand. If you raise your hand at the end of this, um, and when we do Q&A, we can just call on you and unmute you. We're going to keep everyone on mute until then because we have a very large crowd. But we can um, unmute you, and you can ask your question um, at the end of the session as well. So two ways. Either type your question during the session into the chat box and we'll answer it at the end, or raise your hand at the end of the session and we'll call on you. We'll also use the raise hand um, approach for the partner's update so that um, we, uh, you can ask your question uh, to the whole crowd uh, at that, or uh, give, you, give your update to the whole crowd at that point. And we also have a, a very fun surprise during our partner's update. Uh, Betsy Jaffe will be uh, will be showing or uh, previewing ASIC brand new website, which we're going to be unveiling later this year. So let me give you a little bit of background on ASIC before we turn it over to our first panel. Um, ASIC's mission is to make saving and retirement planning a priority for all Americans, and we realize this mission by working with our coalition of major public and private sector partners. Um, in meetings like this. And these are semi-annual meetings, again, normally in person in Washington. Um, and, and we're really happy that um, we're able to meet virtually and have a much broader array of um, people attend the, this meeting than we've had in the past. So that's one benefit of, of the virtual meeting is there's a lot of new faces here um, at the ASIC Partners meeting. On the next slide, we show um, who our um, ASIC partners are that um, are actual members of ASIC. We have charter partners, uh, full partners, contributing partners, partners and mission partners, um, but we consider everyone um, who is working on the goal of helping Americans save just in general and specifically for retirement. We, we consider all of you ASIC partners, and we'll talk more about that in the redesign of our website, and which we're really trying to uh, create a forum for all, everyone um, who is committed to this topic to be able to um, share their content on ASIC's website. Um, so we will kick things off if we turn to the next slide um, with just the kind of the state of where we are today. Th these, uh, these numbers are a, a week or so old, so they may be way different now because things are moving at a very rapid pace. But unemployment rate in June was 11.1%. That's actually down from even a, a higher level um, earlier in the year. Laid off workers losing health insurance, number 5.4 million. Um, unless things change, there, uh, the $600 additional unemployment payment from the federal government ends very soon. 
Uh, the availability of coronavirus distributions for 401k plans, um, which started in uh, earlier this year, goes through December 30th, 2020, and we'll hear a lot more about that from Jack Vanderhei and its impact. Um, and the number of coronavirus, coronavirus cases, when I last looked, is in the Americas with 6.8 million. So we have a very challenging environment that we're navigating from a savings perspective. People have a lot of, um, of, of things going on in terms of um, job loss and just trying to make ends meet. It might seem like savings is a, is a lot to ask right now. But we're here to talk about you know, what, what can be done during the pandemic and also what to be thinking about on the other side. And that's the topic of, all, of in general, all of our sessions today. And in the uh, partners update at the end, we'd like to hear more from you as well. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our, um, our first panel, the state of savings or lack thereof. Um, we have Karen Inkle from uh, Prudential, who will be uh, moderating the session. And um, she will introduce the panel and kick things off. So I will turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Karen. Great. Thanks, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Karen Inkle, and I lead retirement strategy for Prudential Financial. Today, I'll be moderating a panel discussion, as Lori said, about the state of savings or lack thereof during COVID-19. This is the second major <clears throat> crisis in 10 years. It will likely have far-reaching implications on savings behavior and whether or not employees will be able to retire on time. The pandemic has caused a tremendous amount of financial stress and has had a negative impact on many American workers' uh, personal finances. What is going on now, no one expected, and so many were unprepared, and there are still many ambiguities on the path ahead. I think today's webinar is very timely and provides some perspective about the effects of the crisis from the advisor, the institutional, and the individual employee perspective. I'm pleased today to be joined by Jack Vanderhey, Director of Research at the Employee Benefits Research Association, Sarah Cato, Director of Business Strategies at First Financial Group, and Rick Edelman, founder of Edelman Financial Engine. Um, quick background on our panelists. Uh, Dr. Jack Vanderhey is the research director of the Employee Benefit Research Institute. He's also the director of the EBRI Retirement Security Research Center. Dr. Vanderhey has more than 200 publications devoted to employee benefits and insurance, but his major areas of research focus on the financial aspects of private defined benefit and defined contribution retirement plans. Through eBury's retirement security projection model, which leverages a database of actual anonymized account activity of tens of millions of 401k participants, Dr. Vanderhey is able to analyze and simulate the impact of many external factors on retirement income adequacy. Sarah Cato, with greater than 20 years of leadership experience in the mid-sized business market, Sarah serves as Director of Business Strategies Group at First Financial Group. As a professional holding the Certified Financial Planner, Certified Exit Planners, Chartered Financial Consultant, Chartered Life Underwriter, and Certified Retirement Income Professional Designation, she specializes in business succession and retirement income planning. Using an integrative planning approach, she coordinates pre-retirement and retirement income planning with comprehensive business succession strategies and implementation. She helps her clients create a clear, results-oriented plan for their future based on each client's unique goals and set of resources. And last but not least, Dr. Or, I'm sorry, Rick Edelman is a widely known thought leader, thought leader in the financial services industry. He was recognized as one of the most influential people in the financial planning and investment management profession by Investment Advisor, <clears throat> RA Biz, and Investment News. Rick was named in both Research Magazine's Financial Advisor Hall of Fame and Barron's Hall of Fame. He was ranked three times as the nation's number one independent financial advisor by Barron's and among the top, top 10 wealth advisors by Forbes. He's the founder of the RAA Digital Assets Council and with the Bipartisan Policy Center, the funding of our future coalition. He's been awarded two patents for financial product innovation and is also a leading financial edu educator and champion of improving financial literacy for all Americans. He's the award-winning host of one of the longest-running nation's um, personal finance radio shows and has been on air for nearly 30 years. And if that's not enough, he's also a number one New York Times bestselling author with 10 books on personal finance, including a best-selling children's book on money. 
He also teaches personal finance, uh, has taught personal finance for nine years at Georgetown University, and currently is a distinguished leader at his alma, alma mater, Rowan University, which awarded Rick an honorary doctorate in 1999. So let's start with Rick. My first question for Rick is, in the document you recently published, you discussed the far-reaching impact of COVID-19 on the financial ecosystem. Could you provide the group with some thoughts on how the pandemic has and will impact savings and retirement readiness going forward? Well, good morning, Karen, and it's great to be with everybody here on the program today. Uh, I, I think we all realize the severity of uh, the pandemic uh, on the economy and on tens of millions of Americans. What's hard for many of us to fathom are the, all the domino effects, all the ways in which uh, this crisis is permeating throughout society. 110 million Americans entered the crisis in credit card debt, and 23% of them have had to increase their debt as a result of job layoffs and pay cuts. Uh, we also, as uh, Laurie had noted earlier, over 5 million Americans who have lost their health insurance as a result of uh, unemployment. So uh, this is having a, a horrific impact on the ability for ordinary Americans to save, uh, and it's exacerbating the deficit that was already in place of Americans' retirement readiness. Uh, and this uh, situation is not going to get uh, recovered anytime soon. The Congressional Budget Office projects that it's going to take 10 years until 2031 for the unemployment rate to return to where it was prior to the pandemic. That's not uncommon. That type of uh, timeline occurred in uh, the Great Depression. It took over 10 years for the unemployment rate to recover. It, that occurred in the uh, recession in the 1970s, and it occurred uh, 12 years ago during the credit crisis of 08. It is very common for it to take 10 years or more for the unemployment rate to recover. Uh, and as a result of this, we need to recognize that Americans are aging. Uh, Everybody is now, of course, 12 years older than we were in 08 during the last crisis. And the boomers are now retiring. 40% of them are already retired. Uh, and the rest are going to be retired over the next 10 to 15 years. And re their ability to save for retirement has been severely impacted as a result of this crisis. Uh, it's having an adverse impact on commercial real estate, on residential real estate, on uh, college and careers, uh, on the education system as a whole, uh, on charities and philanthropy, uh, on state and local With 50 million Americans out of work, you don't have people earning income that they don't pay income taxes. They're not shopping, so they're not paying sales taxes. They're not driving, not paying gasoline taxes. States are losing 50 uh, billion dollars in lost gasoline taxes, for example. The federal government is losing $36 billion in lost gas taxes. And state and cities are losing billions of dollars in lost revenue from speeding tickets uh, because people aren't driving as much as they were. So it's hard to tell where the dominoes stop falling and the financial implications of all of this. Uh, and unfortunately, most folks expected this virus to be a short that would be over in a few months. We're now beginning to recognize that this is going to last for many, many um, more months to come. And uh, very likely it'll be the end of 2021 before everybody is vaccinated. So we're in this for another 12 to 18 months, potentially longer with economic impact that will last a decade or more. <clears throat> Thanks, Rick. And, and Jack, as you think of that and you know, being in this for another 12 to 18 months, how does that impact your research on, on retirement income adequacy? How have you found your research based on what's previously happened so far with the virus and what we're seeing going forward? How does the duration of this impact kind of the results and what you're seeing in terms of your simulation? Uh, great question, Karen. Uh, David, can you pull up? Thank you. The first slide. Uh, this is a publication we came out with a little bit earlier in the year and incorporating a lot of the types of factors and variables that Rick mentioned. We wanted to try to see what the likely impact on what we had seen at that time was going to be on the aggregate retirement deficit. Uh, we look at all U.S. households, whether or not they're lucky enough to work for an employer who sponsors a retirement plan from 35 to 64. And we come out with a baseline as of January 1st of $3.68 trillion. What that means is that's the additional amount of money in today's dollars that these households would need after tax at age 65 to basically have enough 
money not to run short in retirement. We did a number of different types of assumptions. We looked at investment losses, at least through first quarter of 2020. We looked at employer responses, whether it be suspension of matches, or if they were a small plan sponsor, whether they would actually terminate as a result of this. We looked at employee responses, whether they would be reducing contributions or perhaps increasing withdrawals. And this is all pre-CARES, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about CARES in a couple of seconds. And then we also looked at unemployment and basically how that would end up resulting in a decrease in eligibility. So the numbers you see uh, played out here under the optimistic, the intermediate, and the pessimistic assumptions, we chose different values for each of those variables we mentioned. If you end up using an intermediate assumption, uh, the second from the right, $175 billion increase in retirement deficit amounts to basically about a 4.5% increase over where we already were as of January 1st. Perhaps now more likely, and certainly given what Rick just mentioned, uh, the pessimistic assumptions on the right-hand side get us all the way up to an additional $437 billion, almost another half a trillion dollars, which is about an 11.3% increase. Um, I just want to add, this was all modeled assuming a single wave for COVID-19, and certainly one of the things we're working on right now very carefully is what happens if indeed there is a second wave and some of these durations start being amplified along the kinds of vectors that, that Rick already mentioned. Thanks, Jack. And if we shift to Sarah for a moment, as you look at that, especially the pessimistic scenario and the thought of potentially a second or, or you know, even a third wave, as some have predicted, how do you continue to ensure your clients have the right strategies in place to ensure they have adequate income for retirement and they're responding appropriately to this crisis? How has your guidance changed since COVID and what's actually stayed the same about your guidance? Again, thanks, Karen and Laurie and all those behind the scenes to bring this conference together today. I really appreciate being here. Um, so, the, you know, the outlook of what we're seeing is very serious. And um, as I interface with my clients, for many of them, I'm very thankful of the guidance that I've given them. Um, so, honestly, uh, to hunker down on my philosophy of preparing for the future, preparing for the worst, and hoping for the best and preparing for the future hasn't changed. Um, what will change now uh, for some folks certainly is their expectation of what their retirement is going to look like and what it in fact will be because of the impact and the deficits that they face, loss of jobs, loss of savings, et cetera. I think it, it's, a, it's a reinforcement to me of the, kinds of, of the kind of importance that we have in the lives of our clients. We have to help them move to this new world that they're living in, for sure. But it reinforces the importance of how we help our clients. And it really starts, I have millennial children. I have a lot of clients, of course, that are boomers that are retiring, getting out of their businesses. So the basic tenets of what I try to teach all those age groups are reinforced, and I will hunker down on that because every time I have a crisis in 2008, now and before, the uh, importance of savings always rises to the top. So in my world, I use the world, uh, when I'm teaching, I use the word, the phrase, world-class savers. So if we do analytics on that, becoming a world-class saver is actually more important to our long-term viability in, and stability in retirement than actual uh, reliance on rates of uh, return in the market. So we want to uh, be teach early on and especially as we're moving toward retirement income planning to be a world-class saver. And that is very, very important now as one, as all of us and all of our clients have to rely on emergency funds and liquidity. And I know there's some questions about that in the future. So the basic tenets of protection first, protecting our income, the most valuable asset we'll ever have from our work or our business, um, making sure uh, clients have optimal amount of liquidity and um, I'm very conservative, so I like a lot of liquidity in my clients' world, uh, helping them become world-class savers, 
uh, implementing early on a plan of debt reduction, not living beyond their means, and then, uh, as I've heard uh, Rick so wisely say, investing in the market, but investing to your goals. So those are the basic tenets that I follow. They're reinforced here, uh, even as we may have to help shift our clients to a new vision of their future because of the impact that they've just had. Thanks, Sarah. Rick, sure. Sarah mentioned um, boomers and millennials. Unlike the last financial crisis, this crisis has that added anxiety of the health risk posed from the, the global pandemic, in addition to market volatility. What similarities or differences do you see in your clients' savings and investment behavior today compared to the 2008 financial crisis? And have you observed differences between those age or demographic cohorts, similar to the millennial boomer differences? Yeah, in, in some ways, this crisis is the same as all the other crises that we have experienced in our nation's history. You know, in our living experience, you know, not too many of us were around in 1929, but we were all around in 1987, uh, and we recall the crash of 87, the recession of 92, the uh, dot-com bubble, uh, and the horrific tragedy of 9-11, and of course, the most recent 2008 crisis. And in all of those from a financial crisis perspective, we know that markets react with extreme volatility. Uh, markets fall dramatically uh, for various periods of time, uh, and that ultimately, long term, we get over it, we get past it, life moves on, and the markets uh, attain new highs. And on that basis, now a lot of folks now have a lot of that investment experience, and we have the attitude that hang in there, maintain your long-term strategy, be diversified, hang in there, and this too shall pass. might take 10 years, but it will pass. But this one has added a new wrinkle, as you noted, Karen, and that is the health aspect, that the uh, fact that this virus is killing Americans indiscriminately, regardless of age, regardless of socioeconomic status. We do know that poor uh, Americans uh, are being uh, infected more, and that's um, affecting, therefore, minorities more so uh, than others. And it's not because blacks particularly are more susceptible to the virus, it's because blacks tend to live in more uh, dense housing uh, than whites. And it's the close quarters that is creating the ability for the virus to spread. So we're seeing uh, a disproportionate uh, impact in that regard. Um, but it is creating a new level of anxiety for all Americans, including older investors. Uh, we know that older people are more likely to have adverse health effects if they are infected. Uh, the death rate is much higher for the very old than it is for the very young, uh, according to the latest data. And so people are worrying that the pandemic is going to delay the economic recovery. And coupled with the fact that people are now older than they were in the last crisis, it's causing a lot of folks to question, should I remain invested as I was? People are nervous about three major things right now with good reason. Number one is education. As we bring students back into the classroom and onto college campuses, will that clustering create another wave of infection rates? Are teachers going to be willing to return to schools and campuses? Or are, is the education system going to be forced to shut down and do entirely remote learning uh, with an adverse impact on society because if the kids are home, the parents can't go to work. And 40% of America's workforce have children under the age of 18 living with them at home. So if the kids are at home with online learning, that's going to reduce the ability for the economy to recover. Second is professional sports. Uh, if the NFL cannot play, there is a massive economic impact on our nation's uh, society. Uh, for example, Fox News gets 40% of its annual revenues from Sunday football games. If the NFL can't can't play, there's a massive economic impact to the broadcasting industry and the entertainment industry, and that has massive ripple effects in society, not to mention a big morale hit because we all love sports. And then third, of course, is the upcoming election. All three of these are creating a substantial amount of anxiety, uh, coupled with the fact that there's remaining fears of will I get infected as the season uh, gets colder and the flu season arrives. Uh, people are worried not only about the volatility in the markets due to the economic weakness, but the increased risk of infection. All of this is causing people to naturally say, should I reduce my equity exposure? Should I lower my investment risks? And we are uh, being very careful to respond to our clients, not just to their financial condition, but to their emotional state. Uh, do they have the wherewithal financially to leave their investments untouched no matter what? 
And secondarily, even if you can afford to do that, is that something you're comfortable doing if the stock market falls as much as it did, say, in 2008, when the S&P fell 57% in value? If that were to happen today, it would put the Dow at around 12,000. Is that, is that something people are willing to go through? Um, and even if you're willing to go through it, even if you're determined you don't need the money and you can hang in there, what about your children? If you have kids in their 20s and 30s and they lose their jobs and they encounter financial issues, are you going to be needing to help them out financially? What about your aging parents who might have troubles? What about your siblings, brothers and sisters who may themselves be losing employment undergoing financial stress. If they need financial help in your family, you're going to help them. And that means you may be forced to liquidate your assets, not because you're out of money or because you're panicking, but because you're simply trying to support those you love. So for all those reasons, we are really working hard to deal with each and every one of our clients to confirm that they truly can indeed leave their investments untouched for the duration of this crisis. And if not, to raise their cash reserves to as much as two years worth of spending and to reduce their equity exposure to reduce the likelihood that they might have to sell while prices are down, either because of their financial state, that of their families, or their own emotional condition. So yeah, this crisis is different in a couple of ways from those we've experienced in the past. Thanks, Rick. And, and Sarah, as you think of with your clients and reducing equity exposure, and you mentioned your preference to having that conservatism within liquidity, how have you seen your clients respond in increasing their allocation to liquid vehicles? Has the crisis brought an increased focus to certain types of saving vehicles, such as HSAs, with the complexity of the, the health complex or the, the health component of this pandemic as well? Or has it really been a trend more towards liquidating towards that more cash-based vehicle? Um, actually, probably a little bit of each. I certainly have spent a lot of time uh, with my existing clients um, at their urging, really, and I'm happy about that, uh, reviewing all of their allocation to all of their sorts of financial products and um, having specific conversations with them. And I like what Rick says about um, the emotionality of being in the market other than uh, in addition to just the expectation. So I've had numerous conversations around that. Uh, for the most part, I have to put them in some categories. So people that are, are um, you know, four or five years away from retirement, I'm generally seeing them now want to take some of their investment chips off the table and uh, not take the money out, but reallocate to more conservative uh, allocation status. Um, Certainly, I've seen my clients flock to, and again, I'm speaking to baby boomers, but flock to much more uh, tendency, a greater tendency toward liquidity. Um, I, uh, as mentioned before, I'm very conservative about that, so I'd like my clients to have at least a year's worth of liquidity, uh, uncorrelated assets to the market to help with emergencies. I'm very fine on going to the zone of up to two years, as Rick said. Um, so, yeah, I've seen my clients absolutely call and have those specific discussions about about that. And then we parlay, of course, into if we're going to have all of this money, you know, five, six, eight hundred thousand dollars in liquidity money for some of my clients, where do we put that money? Not just, you know, money markets is not, not going to be attractive to them. So um, trying to reach for some bit of safety where we get a bit more uh, return on that on that cash sitting around still keeping it non-correlated to the market. Thanks, Sarah. And Jack, on the other side of the spectrum, you've got people who aren't able to tap into that liquidity. So following up on the saving and investing behavior, I think there's probably a, a question on recent industry legislation. And the CARES Act waived penalties and withholdings for qualified distributions up to 100,000 from retirement accounts, making withdrawals more attractive for individuals. Separately, the SECURE Act, which was passed at the end of last year, made retirement plans more accessible for Americans. How might potential withdrawals due to the CARES, impact, CARES Act I'm sorry, impact the savings and retirement readiness of participants? And if we think of the CARES Act and the SECURE Act in harmony, um, which aim to increase retirement coverage, what might be the impact of the retirement savings gap in aggregate? Yeah, great question, uh, Karen. I, let me just quickly go through some results of two studies that we've 
one which will be published in the next week or two and one we published earlier this year. This slide is looking at our analysis of what's going on with the CARES Act. And you see under these scenarios um, some of the things you just mentioned. Note that there's two columns and the numbers vary considerably. One is the worst case assumption. So we're assuming in that case, we're looking at people, A, whose employers are making these features available to them. B, it's an employee who is eligible to take advantage of them. And C, if they do take advantage of them, they take advantage to the maximum extent. So for example, in the first row, when we're talking about employees taking the full withdrawal up to $100,000, Obviously, you need an account balance of at least 100000 to take maximum advantage of that. If not, we're just assuming that they take out their full account balance. Um, we're basically assuming no payback at all in that first scenario. And when you basically aggregate across all age cohorts, obviously, this is going to be much different for somebody right on the, the, the verge of retirement who has a much larger percentage of their overall account balance uh, being hit, um, we have about a 20% median reduction in the, in the retirement balances when we measure it as a multiple of their pay at age 65. Going down to that second assumption, what about employees who take that withdrawal, but they pay it back within three years, as you would expect, there's a marked decrease in the impact and we only have about a 2.3% reduction at the median. The third one gets to the loans and here we're assuming you take out a new loan up to $100,000 total balance, but you're paying it back and we give a dollar for dollar offset in employee contributions against those new loan payments. So the money's going back in, but it is impacting the employee contributions as a result and in this case, overall, we caught to about 5.9%. I'm not gonna go through that last scenario. This is just basically per your, your, your previous comments, Karen, if we end up doing one of these hits every 10 years, it obviously mm -hmm. will make it a much, much worse uh, overall impact. What the right-hand column says though, instead of just looking at the worst case assumption in each case, let's look at the fact that not every employer is offering it. Certainly not every employee is eligible, and those that do are probably not going to take this to the maximum extent possible. And obviously now we're getting a much lower overall aggregate impact, some placed a little bit less than a half a percent on that first scenario, and a very, very small impact on the uh, third scenario. So that's what we've done so far in the CARES Act. Like I say, the full publication will be out in a week or two. But the other half of your question on the SECURE Act, David, if you could go to the next slide. This is something that we've been trying to model that looks at not only the impact of open MEPS or PEPS, however you want to refer to it, it also looks at increasing the cap on the auto escalation of contributions under the 401k testing safe harbor. It kicks up the required coverage of long-term part-time employees by age and size of employer. And, and very important, uh, since there were so many assumptions basically floating around on what percentage of small employers who do not currently sponsor a retirement plan would in essence take up an open MEP or a PEP. We actually went with a prudential survey from a couple of years ago that said, <clears throat> depending on the size of the employer, it's gonna be about a 30 to 31% take up rate. So what I guess I would like people to focus on is that red rectangle on the bottom left-hand side. Uh, again, we always break these out by age. Anytime you have modifications to the defined contribution system, you're always gonna have a much bigger impact for the younger individuals and the older individuals that there's just not enough years left for people 60 to 64 to have basically a major impact. What we found overall when you look at all sizes of employers is that we have about a 5.3% reduction in retirement deficits for those people in the 35 to 39 age cohort. 
You would expect, though, if you go down to the number right underneath that, to have something much more substantial for people who work for truly small employers. And if you look at those with less than 100 employees, it basically doubles up to about 10.7%. Again, this is the reduction in the deficits that we had calculated for retirement for these people prior to the SECURE Act. And then obviously, if you go to some place a little bit larger, like 100 to 500 employees, you would expect a slightly smaller impact. And here we're seeing about 8.6%. So to try to answer your question, um, going all the way over to the right-hand side of what we're currently looking at, this is the total impact across all age cohorts. We see overall, we got about a 3% reduction in deficits, just looking at secure. When you add CARES to that, which is again, something we're modeling, in aggregate, we're expecting someplace around a half a percent increase in deficits overall because of people taking the money out, not necessarily paying it back. If they do pay it back, it basically is an offset against future employee contributions. So overall, we're seeing right now about a 2.5% reduction in the overall deficits when you combine the CARES and the SECURE Act together. Great, and we actually just got a question from um, the audience. What can policymakers do to help with that savings gap? So in addition to some of these acts, are there other actions that policyholders or policymakers, I'm sorry, can take to help reduce that um, coverage gap? Well, this may or may not come up in, in a future question, but as long as the, the audience brought it up now, every time we've done modeling on this, without a doubt, the single biggest problem we have for those people who are actually participating in the retirement system through a qualified employer plan is a leakage problem. And what we find over and over is, especially for those people in the lowest income quartile, the impact on what percentage of them will have a reasonable replacement rate at the end matters more on what happens as far as cash out at job change than anything else. Now, whether or not the policymakers are going to actually have something to say about this, I guess is still debatable. I guess the good news is, I believe it was last week, um, a light announced that they're going to start introducing auto portability for their clients, I believe, um, in the next couple of the calendar quarters. And the nice thing about that is whenever we've modeled auto portability, we found that obviously that's going to decrease the overall leakages probably by a significant amount. And that's more than likely going to be better than anything we've been modeling up to this particular point in time. And when you think of Social Security and pensions as well as alternative vehicles for retirement income adequacy, how do you envision COVID impacting pensions and Social Security long term? Okay, this is going to get real tricky because as we know, even before COVID, we had a situation where we were likely to have the trust fund for Social Security going down to zero by about 2034. The projections that were coming out of the chief actuary's office showed that at that time, there'd probably only be enough money for about 77% um, of the benefits that had been promised to be paid at that time. Now, what makes it so difficult to answer, Karen, is we all know it's gonna be a political calculation at that point. The trust fund goes to zero, there's enough money to continue paying benefits, but is it going to be a pro rata reduction or is it going to be some other modification? If it is a pro rata reduction, we found that for the youngest cohort we're looking at, that 35 to 39 year old, we had an increase in retirement deficits by about 17% if there was an across the board cut. Okay, that's what we already knew on January 1st. Now we're in a situation where under COVID-19, the estimates on how much the date at which the trust fund goes to zero 
advances is going anywhere from one year to five years. And we're finding some reduction estimates as high as 31%. So th that's something we're working through right now, but obviously, especially for the younger individuals, the older individuals have the luxury of having Social Security benefits being paid for several years prior to the time the trust fund goes to zero. And especially for the lower income quartile, because so much of their overall retirement income is coming from Social Security, that's going to be a huge impact. Prudential recently had a financial wellness census, and the top source of um, assistance that, that people responded with as seen as the most important source was government. There was a 14% response of um, employers being an important source of assistance within the financial crisis. So turning to Sarah and Rick, as employers seek ways to help employees through this crisis, financial wellness will likely be a strong focus for those employers going forward. What approach can employers take to influence the financial behavior of their employees with all of these externalities happening right now? Well, there's no question that um, it's in the employer's best interest to have a financially secure employee. It reduces turnover. It reduces absenteeism. It reduces presenteeism. It increases productivity. Uh, it lowers the cost for the employer and improves their profits. So it is a win-win. Uh, and employers are increasingly realizing this. Uh, our firm, is, as many know, uh, Element Financial Engines is the largest independent advice provider uh, for 401k plans in the country. We, we provide services to about 150 of the Fortune 500 and, and many thousands of smaller companies. And there's no question that employers are beginning to realize that it's very important for them, even though it doesn't seem to be part of their mandate to, you know, why should they care about how financially well off an employee is, they realize it does matter because employees are spending a lot of time on the job, on the phone with creditors. Uh, and other family members who are struggling financially. And so it affects uh, productivity. Uh, employees who are stressed uh, create more errors, have more accidents, uh, make more mistakes, uh, and so on. So employers recognize that employees need a lot more than merely a 401k plan, merely an employer match in that 401k plan. They need broader assistance for all their personal finances. They need advice on not just the employee benefit programs, but on credit and debt, on buying versus leasing cars, on uh, how to uh, buy a house, on Uh, umbrella liability insurance, pretty much any issue with a dollar sign involved. And employers are recognizing this is a terrific way to help attract talented employees and how to retain them. Uh, and so there's no question that there's a lot of interest in this area, and it's to everybody's benefit mm -hmm. uh, to have these policies and, and programs provided in the workplace. And they can be done extraordinarily inexpensively. Um, and that's why employers are finding these uh, advice programs, such as the ones that we offer in our firm, of tremendous value to their companies as well as to their workers. And then I'll just pick up on that. When I'm working with business owners, and I work in the business owner marketplace a great deal, um, early on, we have significant discussions about their greatest asset, which is their employee pool. And certainly uh, understanding that and recognizing that and helping their employees be better employees, be more attentive, uh, will lead an, an, a business owner to focus on uh, physical health as well as emotional, mental health, and financial health. Um, Certainly financial wellness as a concept has been around for a number of years. And you know, most all of the companies that have a 401k plan have representatives from those plans coming in and educating them, the employee pool, about uh, savings in the 401k and how that works and projection of the future uh, impact and asset that they can create in their 401k. Uh, and that's terrific, and I've done that when I ran businesses before. Um, one of the problems with that is it's a future projection, um, and so you use the mathematical formula to project ahead, which we have to do, but we also have to understand that the projection of where an employee might be financially through a savings program like a 401k 
um, is reliant on the mathematical formula in the future, and then all of the elements of that are variable. So when we move through these crises like we have now, the projections kind of fall apart because they're the variable elements in the formula as well as factoring in human behavior on top of that. Um, one of the things that we've done in, in, in the firm that I work with and on a national level is we've created a program that we make available to all of our business owner clients called um, Wealth Steps. And so Wealth Steps is a wonderful web-based program that really goes beyond, inclusive of beyond 401k uh, savings. And the goal is to teach em uh, all employees at all levels of um, their, their work life history is to how to plan and plan properly and plan comprehensively and plan in order. So each person that uh, participates in that has their own secure uh, website. They can engage in the website, uh, which is financial training personalized to them on their own, or they can um, also tap into uh, financial advisor support. Uh, but basically what we teach them is to protect their income first, uh, create uh, sufficiency, uh, excess uh, liquidity funds, emergency funds, becoming a world-class saver, leading them hopefully to someday be up, up to as much as 20% of their overall earnings into savings, um, reducing debt, and then investing for their individual goals. So the Wealth Steps leads them down that path. So uh, it's a very comprehensive program. We've had great success with it. We have it in employers in over 1,500 employer groups across the country uh, from all sizes, small to, small to publicly traded companies. So I think uh, it's very low cost. It's very easy uh, for employees to, uh, employers to put in front of their employees and reinforces the uh, knowledge that the health and financial health of their employed um, assets is critical to the well-being of their business. And Sarah, both you and Rick touched upon the, the value and even just the low cost that some of these financial wellness offerings can, can be. Um, knowing the value that employees place on worksite benefits beyond retirement and, and this full advice suite of solutions, what advice would you give to employers who feel that some of these tools are no longer affordable? You see at the retirement level, some employers are suspending company matches. Some employers are actually stopping financial wellness programs. So knowing the benefit them, of them and the value of them, what advice would you give to employers who are actually ceasing these programs? I'm sorry, who are actually ceasing the programs? Correct. Um, so it would be, uh, the advice would be to, to the employers, the owners of the business, is to, I would sit down with them, have a comprehensive discussion about the factors that are leading them to downplay or even get rid of some of the wellness programs that they have and see if we can find some excess money to continue the support of the programs. And that could come in the way of um, uh, tax reduction strategies that they not, may not be deploying in the business. It could come in the way of uh, wh what I'm actually having discussions now uh, with some of my employers is the reduction of the physical space that they have. Okay. And that leads to another question we may address, which is um, the virtual community that we live in. So really helping them and reinforcing them that the financial well-being of their employee pool is, is critical and helping them find the money, if you will, to continue to support those programs. And you touched upon the virtual environment through the pandemic, quarantine, social distance, all these new words that have become part of our vernacular. We've seen a rapid trend towards digitization and the acceleration of technology adoption. How has this virtual environment increased your clients' demand, Sarah, for digital tools um, that help people manage their money? How has advising your clients changed in this world that will likely no longer ever go back to the non-digital way that we, we um, operated before? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And um, probably I had the greatest learning curve, even probably more than my clients. So <clears throat> I came back from a, excuse me, <clears throat> from a trip on March the 6th, um, 
and was completely plummeted into uh, our working at home environment. Our offices had closed down, et cetera. Um, I realized that much of the work I did while I was sitting behind my desk in my office was virtual already. So um, it, it was a little shock to me, but it was fairly uh, simple move to move to a virtual env environment with my clients. Uh, the thing that I was really biased about was giving up on the in-person connection with my clients. I feel that uh, all of my relationships with my clients have to be a personal relationship. So that was what was making me very nervous. But after I started on March the 8th, uh, reaching out to my clients, having virtual meetings, virtual planning sessions, et cetera, I really realized that this was, um, it was an internal bias I had, and my clients were right there with me. They were even ahead of me. And maybe I'm biased about that because I live in, you know, the D.C. area where everyone is already living in a very digital world, including digital banking, online bill paying, and all of those things. Um, but it was very little impact. Um, and now I'm even seeing through, through the, so everything that we do is already digital. Um, I was just doing it in an office, and now I'm doing it from home. What I've seen in my corporate background is that the few pieces that could not be done digitally, such as notarized investment forms or trust forms or documents or things like that, even our, corp, our national corporate environment have caught up with the times and were able to do almost everything uh, digitally, even those items that had to be wet signatured, et cetera, in the past. Um, and frankly, I think my clients really appreciate it. They don't like uh, traveling in the DC traffic, et cetera. So I've seen no um, you know, disappointment that we're not meeting in person. And even the new clients that I've never met, uh, those relationships are being built well and uh, have a lot of out-of-state uh, clients. Um, so, um, actually, I think it's good, and I think it's here to stay. And, Rick, building upon that, we've seen many direct-to-consumer financial services companies IPO during this crisis, Lemonade, Select Quote, Go Health, just to name a few. Now that digital only is really becoming the default during the, the pandemic, and, and as Sarah said, really taking, taking hold, how do you expect the financial services industry to continue to evolve to meet customer needs and really to kind of make room for all of these new financial uh, competitors, if you will? Well, it's pretty easy for the financial services industry to adapt, much more so than just about any other industry, because we deal with intangibles. There isn't a physical product. When you buy a stock or a bond or a mutual fund or an annuity or a life insurance policy, there's nothing physically you hold on to. It's just a piece of paper. It's theoretical, really, uh, conjured up out of thin air. And so it's not like a car or a house or food or a bicycle or a hotel. And that allows us to operate virtually very easily because we are – uh, being an intangibles industry, uh, we've been virtual ever since it was invented in 1792 when the very first debt offering was created by Alexander Hamilton. So uh, it's pretty easy for us. And our shift uh, in this industry to virtual, as Sarah has described, was also pretty seamless. We were, I think, one of the first firms in the industry to send all of our workers home because we've built the technology to allow us to do that, and it's been seamless. Uh, and as Sarah mentioned, our clients are loving it too because they don't want to have to travel through D.C. traffic and rush hour nonsense to get to our office. And so they're loving the online life as well. They're FaceTiming with their kids. They know what it's like to do Zoom chats like we're doing here. Uh, attendance is rising uh, because it's so much easier to connect virtually, uh, and it gets the job done. Uh, efficiency is dramatically increased because people aren't wasting time traveling to meetings. Uh, so uh, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, and the advent of new technology and, and the ability for new companies to come into the uh, game and, and be competitors, more the welcome. Uh, you know, there's plenty of room for everybody. There is so much uh, money in America. There's so much wealth being created on a regular basis that we are perennially in a growth industry in the financial services business. We are not a zero-sum game uh, like many others are. For example, if you buy a Coke, it means you didn't buy a Pepsi. Uh, 
Uh, and if Delta wants to increase its market share, it really has to steal it from American Airlines because there's only so many products that these uh, companies are able to sell on an annual basis. And so it, for them, it's usually a zero-sum game. If somebody wins, somebody else loses. But in the financial services industry, that's not the case because wealth is constantly being created. Every time you go to work, a week or two later, you get a paycheck. That's brand new money that you get to invest. So when you invest that new money with me, that didn't cost Sarah anything because she didn't lose money for me to get money and vice versa. So we can both grow uh, our businesses. Uh, and this is what allows the financial services industry to really shine. And it, it, just to give you an idea of the scale of this situation, if you wanted to name uh, the companies that are the top five in the airline industry, you know, we all know who they are, uh, Delta, American, United, they probably capture among the three of them 70, 80, 90% of the total business. That in Southwest and a few others, the top five will have 80 or 90% market share. Look at the computer industry. Look at the hotel industry. Look at any industry you want. The top five players will have an 80 or 90% market share. Merrill Lynch is one of the largest brokerage firms in America. They have less than a 2% market share. If you look at the top 10 money management firms in America, collectively, they'll have less than a 10% market share. In other words, our industry, even though as big as it is, with all the, think of all the huge banks and insurance companies and mutual fund companies and brokerage firms, doesn't matter how big these institutions are, we are playing in such a vast array of economic size that none of us have any market share. Uh, we're like two galaxies coming together that the galaxies are so big that no planets will hit each other, no stars will hit each other because the sizes are so vast. And so there's plenty of room for new players in the industry. It's not going to hurt the existing players and it will help consumers because these new companies are creating products and services offered uh, with better advantages than some of the old players can provide, cheaper, faster, easier new services that haven't been provided before, that the consumer ends up being the winner. It democratizes, it demonetizes, the consumer wins. And the old line big box firms that can't adapt, well, they'll just go away. Um, and nobody's going to care except them. So it's really good news for the consumer, and that's what really matters. And we welcome all comers. It's great news for the industry as we all get to adopt. And this will help us explain why there's a lot of merger and uh, acquisition activity, a lot of M&A. Uh, it's great news for everybody. Well said. So I'd love to keep asking this panel questions for hours, but I want to open it up to the audience and make sure we're addressing your questions as well. Looks like we've got one coming in through chat, and just as a reminder, you can um, submit the questions via chat or raise your hand within the Zoom. So the question we received is to Sarah, are you seeing clients holding off on retirement because of investment losses, or conversely, speeding up retirement because they don't want to go back to work or because they're afraid of getting sick? Um, Karen, I'm sorry, is that for me? It is, yes. Yeah. So I'm seeing both, actually. Um, I, I'm seeing people who have uh, retirement sufficiency, so enough wherewithal from all of their uh, financial assets to say, okay, enough is enough. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm ready now to, to get out of whatever it is, being their employment or their business. Um, those are the fortunate ones. We have the choice. And honestly, a number of people who have gotten out of their business that I work with, and, and that leads to another question that we may not have time to get to, is uh, many of those folks are going into the gig economy. And so I call it their next now. They're not just retiring and playing golf all day, but they're going on to uh, a, sometimes a whole different uh, new, uh, new, new category of work or giving back to the community. And then other folks um, are in a different financial situation. So their choice is to um, either uh, tamp down their expectations of what their retirement world would be like or continue to work for, for a longer period of time. Um, and neither of those are bad. It gets to the quality of the life that the uh, client wants to have. 
So I've absolutely seen people say, okay, I thought I would have three houses. Now I'm just going to have to live in the house they, I have, but I want to go to that level. I want to spend more time with my children. My values are more important than, than the dollars coming my way. And then I have other clients that are going the other way. You know, I'm going to work for 10 more years and I'm going to make up all the money that we've lost or that I haven't yet saved. So it's, it's both. Thanks, Sarah. We had a lot upon a lot of areas today. Obviously, COVID-19 has caused a tremendous amount of emotional and financial stress and has certainly had a negative impact on many American workers' personal finances and continues to do so. Um, the latest fin Prudential Financial Wellness Census shows that more than half of U.S. adults saw their fin finances compromised and nearly one in seven saw their household income fall by half or more in the months following the outbreak. Um, with, again, time telling what, what will happen in the near future. The COVID-19 pandemic will not last forever, but I think Sarah said it best, at a macro level, we need to reimagine our move to this new world. As we reimagine how we live and work, we also need to reimagine how we save and how we are prepared for retirement. So I'd like to thank our panelists today, Jack, Sarah, Rick. Thank you for all for taking the time to be here today, providing your perspectives on savings, and all of the various implications of the macro environment in the pandemic today. And thank you to everyone for joining the panel. And I'll flip it back to you, Lori. Thank you, Karen. And thanks, uh, that was a great way to start off the day. Um, and I really appreciate all the uh, insights we just heard. But uh, we, we will move on. Actually, we, we actually start off the day on somewhat of a somber note. Uh, for those of you who uh, joined us at the outset, um, we were talking about, you know, just the all the, um, the issues surrounding the pandemic, but I actually heard a lot of positives from this first session. Uh, we heard about world-class savers, the benefits of going to a virtual environment, and the strength of the financial services industry. Uh, we will 